Hiya and welcome back to another video on A Level Law. Today we're going to be talking about murder. So, first thing you need to know is the definition, and this comes from Edward Coke in the 17th century, so that's 1600s. Um, and you can see it on the left there, it's fairly complicated and old fashioned wording. So, murder is when a person unlawfully killeth any reasonable creature in Rome Natura under the Queen's Peace with malice aforethought. Now, you certainly don't have to learn that definition verbatim off by heart. You can actually learn the broken down version, a more modern version on the right, which you can see there. What does this mean? Unlawfully kills a human being under the Queen's Peace with malice aforethought. And malice aforethought is actually the mens rea. So, you can see there that actually means intention to kill, which we call express malice, or intention to do GBH, which we call implied malice. And we'll go through a bit more of that in more detail in a second. Uh, murder is generally defined in common law. There is no statute per se covering the definition. Um, so that comes with multiple problems, which we'll talk about later. Um, it is obviously indictable, which means it's tried in the Crown Court. And the maximum sentence is mandatory life. And you'll have learned about this on when you did sentencing, hopefully. So mandatory life uh, means you get a tariff and the minimum tariff uh, for an adult is 15 years. And it can go up to whole life, obviously being the most extreme version. You can see there I've also broken down the actus reus and mens rea. So you can see the actus reus is unlawfully killing a human being under the Queen's peace, and the mens rea is malice of forethought, as I said earlier. So if we go on to start to explore these different parts of the definitions, we're going to start with unlawfully. Um, unlawfully means the defendant doesn't have a lawful excuse for killing the person. Um, obviously, you can lawfully kill people in certain circumstances. Um, I've got a couple here where you can and can't. Uh, the first one is self-defence, in which case you can kill someone lawfully um, if it is in self-defence. Um, obviously, the force has to be reasonable still, and obviously, if they're trying to kill you and you kill them, sort of in the scuffle or something along those lines, then that would, of course, probably be reasonable, and that would be a lawful excuse for killing. Therefore, it wouldn't be an unlawful killing. Um, Arvi Martin's example, where actually it didn't work, uh, that's a case where he was a um, farmer, he was terrorised by some ewes, and eventually he, they broke into his kitchen, he shot down to the kitchen and they ran away and he shot one of them in the back as they ran away. Um, and the court held that that was not reasonable force because he was shooting as he was running away and therefore self-defence failed and therefore he had no lawful excuse for the killing. So he was guilty of murder in that case, which seems fairly unfair, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, duress is not an excuse, a legal excuse for murder, so you cannot use it as a defence. Uh, that comes from the case of R.V. Howe, R.V.H.O.W.E., um, which we'll talk about when obviously we go on to duress as a separate topic. Um, it's uh, quite unfair, and again, we'll talk about that when it comes to the O3, um, but we'll leave that as, as for now. Uh, necessity, um, again, it can't be a defence. In Dudley, v. Stevens, Dudley and Stevens, sorry, that's the cabin boy case. Uh, they were adrift from sea on a life raft, uh, and they killed an the cabin boy, um, and they were not able to use necessity as a defence to murder, it would, even though it was necessary for them to survive, it's similar to duress, you can't make that decision. Um, they were actually uh, pardoned by the Queen because they were sentenced to be hung or hanged, um, but they were pardoned, but they were still convicted of it so they couldn't use it. Uh, and again in REA they tried to use necessity, so REA is the conjoined twins case, um, except they couldn't, uh, and in the end they used self-defence along those lines if you have a look at that case in more detail. And finally, um, the armed forces, of course, uh, have lawful excuses for killing, although don't get too caught up in that because there's separate rules uh, for the armed forces that you don't need to know on this course. Uh, but just be aware that it you know, comes under the sort of self-defence bracket almost um, in that regard. Moving on to killing or kills. Um, killing can be done by an act or an omission. In Gibbons and Proctor, where they failed to feed or care for their daughter um, and starved her to death, that was seen as an omission and that was fine to be murder. That, you know, it doesn't have to be an act. Um, but because murder is a result crime, you have to prove that the defendant caused the death, so therefore causation is key here. And you go through the same uh, rules as you would go for if, if through for involuntary manslaughter, for instance, or anything like that, anything with causation. It's the same three rules always. Firstly, is factual causation, and that's the but-for test. So but for the defendant's actions, would the victim be dead? So basically, if the defendant hadn't have done what they did, would the victim be dead? Um, you can see that in Padgett and White, uh, both opposite cases really, Padgett, um, they said if he hadn't have held his girlfriend hostage, she wouldn't have been shot by the police. Um, so therefore, he was the factual cause. Um, so, but for his actions, she wouldn't be dead. Um, White is the opposite. That but for his actions of poisoning his mum or trying to poison his mum, uh, she would have died anyway from the heart attack. So it's the opposite way, really. Legal causation used the Kimsey test. Uh, Kimsey, they were racing, and uh, the other racer crashed into a tree and died. 
And the question is, is there more than a slight or trifling link between D's actions and V's death? So you just simply, is there a very small link? That's what you're looking for for legal causation. And finally, there has to be no intervening acts. And there are a number of categories for those. So uh, acts of a third party, victim's own act, uh, and natural and unforeseeable um, events. Um, the most relevant there usually is uh, acts of a third party around someone like a doctor or something. Uh, but also remember the thin skull rule too, if that's relevant. There'll be another video on that. Um, coming up separately, um, so just make sure you think about the cases like Blau for that, etc., um, and just consider it if it is relevant in the scenario. In terms of a human being, you'd think this was fairly simple. Uh, there are some complications. Uh, it has to be a human being. Obviously, it can't be an animal. That would cover under, that would be covered under animal cruelty laws or something like that, probably, but not murder. Um, and equally, the, the case came up as to when uh, someone becomes a human being. Uh, so obviously, this came up in the case of 80s reference, number 3, 1994. Um, man stabbed his pregnant girlfriend. The baby was born prematurely at seven months and died four months later. Uh, and he was acquitted of murder of the child because the point was... Uh, a fetus is not a human being. Don't get caught up in the case there about it, you know the baby dying after being born and things like that. Just focus on the key point there, which is they said a fetus is not a human being. And we'll talk about that more in detail in terms of the AO3. It's also worth bearing in mind when someone's class is dead. Uh, and they usually use the brainstem death as a point of brain dead, uh, which means the brainstem at the back of your um, back of your brain, back of your head, uh, is actually dead and therefore you can't come back from that. So uh, that's the test they generally use. And again, we'll talk about that in terms of the A3 and the relevance as to why that's important. Under the Queen's Peace is usually very simple. Uh, basically, killing an enemy in time of war under warfare rules is not murder. So this sort of makes sure that the soldiers, etc., aren't guilty of it. Uh, but remember that killing enemy civilians could still be murder. And there are lots of rules, like I said, under um, armed forces and things that you don't need to know specifically. So that shouldn't be an issue there in the scenario. But again, I'll mention that later. Year and a day rule, this no longer applies, but you may come across it in your reading. Uh, you may have been taught about it at your college. Um, law reform year and a day rule removed it. The year and a day rule basically was that if the person uh, you injured or did whatever you did to them didn't die for a year and a day, then you couldn't be guilty of causing their death. So you basically were not liable if they lived for a year and a day. Um, it was based largely around sort of the fact that they didn't, they couldn't really tell in the olden days how someone or why someone had died necessarily. And again, we'll talk about that more in the O3 uh, in a bit, but just remember that no longer applies. In terms of mens rea, as I said, it's malice of forethought, and you can see there what that means. So it either means intention to kill or intention to do GBH. Don't get caught up with the express and implied malice. It doesn't really matter. You, don't, you can ignore those names if you want, um, but they are the names there. So intention to kill means express malice. Intention to do GBH means implied malice. But like I said, you don't have to call it express and implied malice. You can simply use the intention to kill, intention to do GBH phrases instead if you prefer. Uh, you can see intention to kill in R.V. Kalheim, so that's where a wife hired a hitman to kill her husband. Obviously, she clearly had intention to kill by hiring a hitman. And intention to do GBH can be seen in R.V. Vickers, where he broke into and beat up uh, an old blind lady in a sweet shop. Um, he didn't intend to kill her necessarily, but she did die from his uh, GBH he did on her, uh, and he was equally as guilty. So that's a really important case, and again, we'll talk about that at a relevance to that when we come to AO3. Obviously, this is probably the most complicated bit of the course, I would say. So what's the difference between direct intent and oblique intent? People get very uh, caught up and find oblique intent quite difficult. So we'll start with direct intent. Direct intent is simply uh, you intended to kill or do GBH, as we already said, the mens rea, as we've learned it so far. So the defendant's purpose, uh, they set out to bring it about, as we saw from the definition of Mohan. So Mohan describes intent as a decision uh, to bring about a prohibited consequence. So don't get confused with that bit either. That's just the definition of intention. So direct intent is where you directly intend to kill or do GBH. That is your intention. That's what you're intending to do. And that's obviously the easiest thing. If they can prove that in the court, then you are guilty. You know, you've got the mens rea. The difficulty is someone, someone says, well, I didn't intend to do either of those things. And it's difficult to prove it. That's when oblique intent comes in. So this is where D intended something else, but death occurred. Now, obviously, in some cases, they still want to convict you of murder because actually what you've done is tantamount or testament to murder. Like, it is, you know, you, you can't get, they don't want you to get away with it just by saying, oh, I didn't intend to kill or do GBH. So, um, the first thing we'll look at here is obviously where the test is found. Uh, and it's found in Section 8 of the Criminal Justice Act, 1967. It's called the Foresight of Consequences Test, the FOC test, you can see there. Um, 
Now, this is a really complicated test. Its wording is, if you look it up online, the wording is really, really complicated. It's really hard to understand what it's even saying. And obviously this is being put towards jurors uh, who are lay people and perhaps have no legal knowledge whatsoever, or perhaps not even much of an education in some circumstances possibly. Um, so there are issues there. So over the, you know, between 1967 and sort of 1990s towards 2000, uh, the judges have tried to simplify the law, the wording of that test, uh, so jurors can understand it. Now, the most recent two cases on that, or well, not the most, very most recent, but two of the most important recent cases are Nedrick and Woolley. Nedrick uh, changed that wording. I sort of call it a rebrand. It's still the force of consequences test, but they call it now the virtual certainty test. And the question is, was death a virtual certainty of these actions? Now, that's a very simplified um, version. So you may have learned a more complicated or the actual probably more realistic and uh, one they use. I've simplified that right down to a sort of simple bit to understand it. Um, so it's worth doing some reading around that and really making sure you understand the virtual certainty test. Just to clear what happened in Nedrick, he put lighter fluid through and a lighter newspaper through a letterbox intended to frighten the occupant, but it ended up killing a child. So he said, well, I didn't intend to kill or do GBH this child. Um, but they said, well, you intended to do, uh, to scare them. Uh, was it a virtual certainty that that was going to kill the, the child or someone in the house? Yes, so therefore you're guilty still. So it's quite difficult wording, as I said, but that's sort of how they approach it. William, very unpleasant case. He threw his baby against a wall and killed it. He said he was trying to throw it into the pram. Uh, now, it was about yeah, four or five metres or so, you know, so the, the judges and the court looked at this and thought, well, you know, realistically it's murder. So the prosecution obviously went down the oblique intent route because they wanted to obviously try and prosecute him and convict him. Because he was saying, well, I didn't directly intend to kill or do GBA, so direct intent was perhaps an issue there. Um, and the question was, you know, is it uh, is there virtual certainty that if you throw your baby five metres across the room towards the wall, that's going to kill it? Probably yes. So therefore, they said, well, you are guilty, sir, and he was convicted of murder. Now, William made a small change to the wording of the virtual certainty test. It changed the word infer to find. Again, trying to make it simpler, you know, infer's quite a weird word. Find, you, you know, that's a clearer word. The jurors are entitled to find um, intention in those cases. Um, so it was just trying about trying to simplify the test uh, for juries again. Law Commission uh, published a report in 2006 uh, called Murder, Manslaughter and Fantaside. Obviously it wasn't just on murder there, but they described murder as a rickety structure set upon shaky foundations. So uh, definitely a criticism. And they made five main criticisms of the law, uh, which I'll go through in a minute, but basically that it was piecemeal development, implied malice is unfair, the mandatory life sentence doesn't reflect levels of blameworthiness, it's unfair duress is not a defence to murder, and there are problems with excessive force under self-defence. So if we work through the area three now in terms of an essay, uh, the first thing is obviously there, one of the criticisms from the Law Commission, that the development has been piecemeal. Now what that means is it's been bit by bit, staggered over decades with no real pattern, so just case by case, adding bits to it. Um, obviously all of the law is common law, except uh, Section 8 of the Criminal Justice Act and perhaps uh, the Year and a Day Rule uh, Law Reform Act. Uh, but a majority of the law is case law or common law, uh, which means it's made by judges. Uh, and then obviously that raises problems with separation of powers from Montesquieu who came up with that idea, um, plus uh, parliamentary supremacy, judicial lawmaking, all those issues that you can usually talk about, you know, the fact that you know, should they really be making the law when actually parliament are the ones that are elected and they're the ones with the rights to make the law. Judges are unelected, you know, they're not, we know they're not necessarily reflective of society, you know, they tend to be white uh, old men uh, generally from private school backgrounds and things like that generally conservative so you know do we want these people making a majority of the law um on the other hand you know why have parliament perhaps not got involved well murder is obviously the most controversial defense um it's you know sometimes you say why fix something that's not broken and that might be their approach you know it works fairly well um, it's probably largely because they just it's a controversial topic and they largely don't want to get involved with it in the same way that they haven't really got involved with reforming um, Offences Against the Persons Act, uh, OPERS, under non-fatal offences. You know, it's just they generally try and steer clear away from these um, topics just in case they, you know, they legislate on it and then something's wrong with the law and then they're to blame. So perhaps that could be a cynical reason. Um, it could be, like I said, just perhaps because they don't want to fix something that's not necessarily broken. Um, Number two, uh, implied malice is unfair. So this is the idea that intention to cause GBH makes death, uh, sorry, in death makes uh, murder very broad. The fact that it's, you know, most if you ask someone on the street what is murder, they will say it's intention to kill. Whereas actually we know from the law, it includes intention to do GBH. Now should someone 
that intends to GG rage on someone, doesn't intend to kill them, but then they die, should they be guilty of murder? Or is that more um, unlawful act manslaughter? Um, probably, it is legally probably unlawful act manslaughter. Um, but equally, you know, if you imagine you're the victim's family and the defendant saying, well, I only intended to do serious harm to them, I didn't mean to kill them, are you going to be that sympathetic? Do you think the court's going to be that sympathetic? You know, public policy sort of viewpoints. You know, that person's still going out in the street intending to do serious harm, so they're still a danger to society. So, and they have killed someone. Um, and when we're talking about death as well, we're also talking about the kind of idea around sanctity of life. You know, we consider life to be really important, the most important thing in the whole society. Uh, sanctity of life really means around like God given. So, whether you're religious or not, it's the idea that only God can give or take life. Um, so, that's the sort of idea that a lot of our system and sort of viewpoints are based on here. Um, number three, the mandatory life sentence does not reflect levels of blameworthiness. Um, you know, with a mandatory life sentence, anyone that's convicted of murder under any circumstances is convicted is given a mandatory life sentence, which means they get 15 year minimum tariff upwards. Um, that is potentially unfair because there are lots of different types of murders, really. You know, if you compare someone that kills uh, like a serial killer, a cold blooded killer, someone that takes drugs and is high and then kills someone. Um, someone that kills someone in self-defense in the house but uses too much force perhaps, someone that kills someone under duress, uh, someone that takes someone to Switzerland uh, for euthanasia, you know, assisted suicide. These are all different types of murder, yet all of those in theory would get the mandatory life sentence, and yet there are different levels of blameworthiness there that's not taken into account. The other issue is that it puts enormous pressure on juries. You know, juries know that they're going to get the life sentence if it's murder. Um, and that's quite a hard decision. Even though there are 12 of you, it's quite a hard decision. You put yourself in that situation. Would you want to make that decision where you're potentially sending someone to prison for life? Equally, number four, uh, duress is not a defence to murder. So duress, remember, is where perhaps someone comes up to you and says, I'm going to kill you unless you go and commit this crime, or I'm going to do serious harm to you unless you go and commit this crime. Usually that is a defence, but it's not to murder. So if someone came up to you and said, I'm going to kill you or seriously injure you unless you go and kill somebody, if you went and killed that person, you would be guilty of murder. And then, of course, you'd get the mandatory life sentence again. And that seems slightly unfair because, you know, you're not doing it in the same way as a cold-blooded killer, like someone just going out intending to kill. Um, you've got, you know, a pretty good justification there. But the law clearly says in Harvey Howe that you can't decide that your life was worth more than someone else's. And that goes back to the sanctity of life thing, the idea that God can choose that, not you. Which basically means that you have to sacrifice yourself, which seems fairly unrealistic uh, and unfair in, you know, lots of circumstances. Um, so there's a question there as to whether that should be allowed or at least, you know, perhaps result in a discretionary life sentence or something along those lines. So almost like a partial defence along the lines of uh, loss of control and diminished responsibility under voluntary manslaughter. The other big issue is reasonable force limits under self-defence. So if someone uses excessive force in self-defence, then uh, they can still be guilty of murder. So if they kill someone during self-defence and the court says that's excessive, uh, again, they get a mandatory life sentence for murder, which again seems very unfair. Could that not be reduced to discretionary life or something along those lines? Um, they have since changed this. So the Crime and Courts Act 2013 uh, made adjustment where actually if, you, uh, if you're in your house, you're a householder, uh, and you, you um, can use excessive force, and excessive force is reasonable. To be bad, it has to be grossly excessive, and then that would not be a, that would be not be allowed. Uh, so it's basically widened the amount of or greater the amount of force you can use in your house to defend yourself, which was obviously very popular with the public. When does life begin and end? Obviously, AG's reference said a fetus is not a human being. Uh, obviously, huge issues there around um, abortion. If they'd have said that that was murder, then you know is. What would that say about abortion and the judges' viewpoints on abortion? So perhaps they avoided it for that reason. Um, there's lots of viewpoints you can sort of discuss around that, so I'm not going to leave that in, uh, not going to do much detail. The other issue is when does life end? So, you know, typically when someone, people generally think when someone stops breathing, they're dead. So if I, someone had a heart attack and stopped breathing for five seconds and I stab them, am I killing a human being at that point? Or is that person not a human being because they're dead? Um, and that's, again, a theoretical point. There's no real cases on that, but it's something worth maybe just mentioning or discussing because it's quite an interesting point. 
Number seven, why is it good that the year and day rule was removed? Well, the year and a day rule was really in place, like I said, because they couldn't tell necessarily how someone had died. So the general viewpoint was, if you lived for a year and a day after someone had like stabbed you, for instance, then it was very likely that you didn't die from the stab wound, you died from something else, so, you know, from an illness or a disease or something like that. Nowadays, um, of course, we can do quite uh, detailed post-mortems and work out why someone died and the causes and things like that. So actually the year and a day rule might not be so relevant anymore. And that's part of the reason why they got rid of it. Equally, we can keep people alive for a lot longer now on life support. So the idea, if the year and a day rule still applied, if someone was on life support, uh, for a year and two days, for instance, and then we decide to take them off, that would mean that the person that put them there in the first place, so stabbed them or whatever, wouldn't be guilty of murder, which we wouldn't want anymore as well, because we would want them to still be liable. So again, that's another reason why they got rid of the year and a day rule, which is, again, a positive. Number eight, issues around uh, oblique intention. So oblique intention, it's, like I said, really complicated. The foresight consequences test is a nightmare. They have tried to simplify it, which is a really good thing. The judges have actively tried to make it more... Uh, clearer, but it is still very confusing. You know, the virtual certainty test under Will and Nedrick is still very wordy, still very confusing. Um, but again, it's really important that this is, you know, they do get this area of law right because this person's potentially getting a mandatory life sentence. So it's really important that the law should be absolutely crystal clear. And again, you could argue that a plea contempt shouldn't even be considered. Um, but there are certainly circumstances like in Will and Nedrick where perhaps public policy, you would want them to be given to murder and not something else. Nine uh, is obviously a very old definition, comes like again from the 17th century. Should the law be reformed and updated to modern day? You know, there's lots of different ways someone can kill someone nowadays, possibly. Should the law be updated to reflect that? Equally, you know, why is the definition come from a single person, uh, Edward Coke? You know, should it really be defined by parliament nowadays, not just a single individual? And finally, issues with, with issues with causation. There are always issues around sort of multiple causes, multiple actors involved. How do you tell who was liable for the death? if they see multiple people well multiple people like were uh, or you know stabbing them or you know that would be covered on joint enterprise to be fair but there are some issues around causation that you can just sort of mention there as well and sort of intervening acts and things like that but i wouldn't go into huge much depth on that one um, in terms of finalising this, the Law Commission report did make uh, some reform proposals. They proposed two new offences, first degree and second degree murder. Don't confuse that with America, they're completely different. Uh, they just use the same names. Uh, so first degree murder is where the defendant intends to kill or cause serious harm and is aware that their conduct poses a serious risk of death. That would get a mandatory life sentence. Second degree murder is where D intends to do serious injury but is not aware that there's a serious risk of death. And that would carry a maximum of a discretionary life sentence. So that would clearly set out the law and would be a huge improvement. But in 2008, uh, the government rejected it and they said uh, they didn't want to do it. But bear in mind, they did implement the Crime and Courts Act changes to self-defence, which we mentioned earlier, which was a positive. Probably this would be a good idea to change, but it's unlikely in the near future, I would say. Finally, when you're looking at scenario, there's no, there's no slide on this, but if you're looking at scenario, make sure you go through each bit of murder uh, methodically. So make sure you cover um, the mandatory, so I'm sorry, make sure you go through unlawfully killing a human being under the Queen's Peace with malice of forethought, um, and make sure you tick off each bit uh, as you go through the scenario and uh, illustrate you know, why that's been met um, in as much detail as possible. Thank you very much, I hope you found that useful, uh, and subscribe if you do, and there'll be more videos coming out on other topics like contract law and tort law soon. Thank you.